Hello everyone. My name is Mukesh Jain. I'm the Chief Academic Officer at University Hospitals. And it's really an honor and privilege for me to be here today speaking with Dr. Peter Agre, a brilliant scientist, Nobel laureate, and science activist. Dr. Agre is an alumnus of University Hospitals where he gained his internal medicine training and I'm just delighted to have this conversation with him in advance of his visit in early November when he will be delivering the inaugural UH Distinguished Scientist Lecture. Welcome, Dr. Agre. Thank you. It's a privilege to be engaged in conversation with you, Akesh. Bring, bring back memories of my fondest times in yeah. Cleveland. Well, thank you, Peter, for joining us. And maybe I can get started with our conversation uh, and just ask uh, a little bit about you personally. You grew up, if I recall, in Minnesota. And can you tell us a little bit about your family and childhood? Sure. I was born in Northfield, Minnesota, a small college town south of Minneapolis. My dad was the chairman of chemistry at St. Olaf College. And we didn't know the people across town at Carleton College. They were considered sort of dangerous or wicked. <laughs> it's just a myth, the college rivalry. But it was an idyllic place to be a child. And having a father who was a chemistry professor provided some special opportunities. My, my brothers and I would oftentimes go up to his laboratory and he had little experiments rigged, something funny, something interesting, something eye-catching. I, I distinctly recall him taking us to his laboratory where there was a beaker of water and he put a drop of a colorless solution. So it looked like he was dropping water into water, but the beaker suddenly turned brilliant pink. And then he took a drop of another solution and dropped it in and the pink disappeared. It, it, was, it was incredible, of course. This was an indicator dye, it was protonated and then deprotonated. So there was an explanation. So my view of magic as a child was science, chemistry. And I remember being so caught up with this idea that in it was in second or third grade, we were asked to draw a picture of ourselves when we'd grown up in, in, in our careers. And I carefully drew a picture of a chemist with a test tube that at the, the laboratory bench. And I noticed sitting beside me, it's because my, my father was my hero. I noticed sitting beside me was my great, great friend, Jay Peterson, whose father was a professor of biology. And Jay was drawing a picture of a burglar. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered what became of Jay. <laughs> and it turns out he became a primate biologist at the zoo in Chicago. He didn't become a burglar, fortunately. And it was a fascinating time in history because in October of 1957, when I was in second grade, was when Sputnik was launched. And th this was a major shift in the American priority. But suddenly, the U.S. that viewed itself as culturally and scientifically and in every way superior to our adversaries, the Soviet Union, had been beaten into space. And you think a second grader would not notice that. Well, it, I, I noticed it because my father decided then and there he was going to do a sabbatical to increase his scientific credibility. He, he, he had trained at the University of Minnesota and then was an experimental scientist at the DuPont station back to Minnesota. And so he, he he had become in contact with Linus Pauling at Caltech. Hmm. And the original plan was he would join Pauling's lab, but it turned out Pauling was never in his lab those years. He was traveling about because he was advocating the termination of testing of nuclear weapons. So the Agri family packed up the old station wagon. And I like to remember this is kind of a Norwegian version of the Beverly Hillbillies. And we drove across country and lived in Berkeley, California for a year. And the change from Northfield to Berkeley is about like 
leaving Lake Wobegon for Sodom and Gomorrah. Is, right. It was a completely That's different. Dramatic. And vibrant. So I, I was fortunate that way. Early childhood emphasis on science. And even as an adolescent, when I became a Boy Scout, my, my, my dad would help the troop by arranging to have the camp physicals. It was required by the Boy Scouts of America that the night before camp, a final just quick checkup to make sure everybody's well, and they had to have a doctor do that, which was for many troops, working class troops, not, not easy. And we, at that point, we lived in Minneapolis. And our troop was, really was a working class troop. My dad, to, with all of his audacity, had Charles Mayo and a contemporary from the Mayo Clinic come up and examine the boys of Troop 185 and certify that they were ready for Boy Scout camp. So there was some familial encouragement. Oh, that's fascinating. And it's so interesting uh, that your father was uh, a childhood hero and, and turned you on to science and chemistry. And that, well, of there's course... something called adolescence, which changes all of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Into the wonder year. Well, well, clearly it had an impact, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. When did you develop an interest in becoming a physician? And were there events or individuals that have might, might have inspired that career path? Well, dad was chairman of chemistry, but he had a large number of the pre-medical students at St. Olaf were chemistry majors. This is really before the revolution in biology. So biology was mostly zoology and classifications and descriptions, but not at a molecular level. And so many of his best students went on to graduate school or medical school. And so getting to know these people was encouraging. And they, they, they were family friends. So it was always a, a, an intriguing option. And as I, as I grew older, certainly by the time I was in high school, I recognized that being a medical doctor is a very special privilege. It's a great career with many different possible directions and universally acclaimed by the populace. Very important in the lives of the citizens. So it would be kind of hard not to be interested in being a medical doctor. And I didn't have any exceptional talents. I was not a great athlete or a renowned singer. I was just another kid. But interest in some unusual connections to science, but medicine grabbed my fancy. And so I think from about ninth grade on, that was my career goal. And in particular, I think medical research. Well, that serves as a um, wonderful segue to my next question. So you, at a relatively young age, as you described, develop an interest in medicine and you following your medical training at Hopkins, you completed your residency at UH. So tell us about the, the experience at Hopkins and then your experience at UH and what influenced your decisions to come here. I think those long winters in Minnesota, I, I stayed at, high, at home for high school and, and for college. Dad had taken a, a new Challenge. He was the chairman of chemistry at Augsburg College in Minneapolis. Now it's called Augsburg University, but it is a small Lutheran college. And the experiences of doctors in far off exotic places is something I, I, I found really interesting. And in our community, there were a number of individuals who become medical missionaries. And, and these, these were really medical doctors and nurses who went off to places like Cameroon or no, northern India and would work for decades. And I, I wasn't much of a churchgoer, but I thought the idea of world health or global health, it was at a point that no one was talking about it in the 1960s, but it, that, that seemed appealing. And when I... Graduated from college, I finished early, so I had the better part of a year for travel in East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, 
got to see firsthand some of the catastrophic health problems that poor people in the world are, are dealing with. And I, as a medical student, got interested in cholera. 1970, the toxin released by Vibrio cholera had been isolated, purified by Richard Finkelstein at the University of Texas. And suddenly this horrible killer of small children and adults throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia had a molecular explanation. And so I, I worked in a research laboratory at Johns Hopkins with Brad Sack, who was involved in the, the Johns Hopkins cholera research station. And it was in Calcutta and then moved to Dhaka, Bangladesh. And so uh, I, I, as a medical student, was working in Brad's lab. And then we, we proposed that we try to purify the toxin that some strains of E. coli release. It was well known that the, the clinical ailment, which commonly is described as traveler's diarrhea, hmm. was not cholera. It was light cholera, somewhat less severe, but strains of Escherichia coli, E. coli, had been implicated, but no one had been able to isolate the toxin. And so my roommate in medical school, Van Bennett, was doing a PhD and an MD. Hopkins at that time did not have an MD-PhD program, but there were a few individuals who did MDs and did a PhD as well. And he was working in the laboratory of Pedro Cuatro Casas, a, a young Spanish-born investigator who was using affinity chromatography for the very first time in biological systems to separate molecules. And it was a really powerful experience. I ended up staying a year after medical school to work on the project. And when it came time to apply for residencies, uh, Hopkins and Case Western Reserve University Hospitals had made a strong connection because Charles Carpenter, who was very revered here at Hopkins, he was the chairman of medicine at the Baltimore City Hospital, had accepted the professorship case, and it was clear to me that this was the opportunity to have some research connections and work for someone that was greatly respected. And we had a lovely apartment up in Euclid Heights Boulevard, and I, I just ride my bicycle down the hill to the university hospitals, and it was a, a good match for me. I, I think it was a program with strong academic credentials, but also very pleasant people to work with. It, it was a natural fit. And, and I think I had spent so much time working in the lab as a medical student, I, I was one of the slow starters in terms of the interns. I tried to catch up to the class, but it, it, it was clear that uh, my interest in science was gonna lead me to a, a different career from the career of most of the residents. Right. And are there experiences or mentors or colleagues that stand out to you from your time at university hospitals? Oh, sure. First off, Chuck Carpenter, we called him the tall man. And yeah. I, I like to show a slide of the internship class, interns and residents of 1976 or 1977. And Chuck is in the front row standing, and I, I'm standing behind him two steps higher and we're the same height. <laughs> I'm, I'm five nine and he was probably six six. And he was a wonderful role model and source of strength. He, he pushed the residents to take responsibility and it, it was a very inspiring experience. I, I also worked in the lab with Jim Carter. Jim had trained at Mass General, I was interested in hepatocytes and liver biochemistry. And I had arranged to do a, a, an elective with a, a new program that they had in global medicine 
uh, the plan was to continue the work on the E. coli toxin and set up a testing assay in Ethiopia. And the Ethiopia opportunity was canceled due to the, the unrest, due to the political instability. I ended up working at Jim's lab in Cleveland, and he was a very wonderful mentor. And of our internship and residency group, Michael Letterman, who is still out in your faculty, he was, he was a very inspiring colleague. He was my resident when I rotated through the VA hospital. And I, I had the greatest respect and admiration for Mike. And I still do. Well, he. I think the feeling is mutual, and I know Michael is very much looking forward to your to your visit. So it, it'll be great for for the two of you to catch up. Thank you. So you finished residency, and you completed Hemonk Fellowship at UNC Chapel Hill, and then returned to Hopkins in the lab of Van Bennett in the Department of Cell Biology. At this point, were you pretty set? Having completed the MD, you already had some experiences in research. Were you pretty uh, set on the career as a physician scientist, or were there other events that happened that convinced you that this is your calling? In fact, it, it was a, a unique opportunity. So Van was my roommate in medical school. We, we became best friends the first week of med school because we had so many shared interests. But he, he was a superb chemistry student at Stanford and knew he wanted to make a career in biomedical research. But during the Vietnam era, if he had enrolled in graduate school, he would have been drafted. And so his view of the MDB part was basically to get background for his research interests. And Van very much encouraged me to, when I joined the UNC hematology oncology program to do my research at the Wellcome Laboratories. Burroughs Wellcome at that time was an independent pharmaceutical manufacturer, but they had a very interesting tradition. It, the stockholders of Burroughs Wellcome were the, the Wellcome Trust. So profits were deposited in the Wellcome Trust and they, they used this to to fund research in the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. So it was a drug company that had a conscience. And so I, I joined the Welcome Labs specifically so I could work with Van, who had, following medical school had done a one-year postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University in the biology department with Daniel Branton and was working on red cell membranes, membrane po proteins. And being a hematology fellow, I, I had access to patients. And of course, the, we, have, we all know that sickle cell anemia is due to a hemoglobin problem, but there are other diseases of red cells that where they're misshapen and the cause was not known. And working with Van, we were able to identify major structural defect in red cells from patients with hereditary spherocytosis. Not, not a major disease, but a longstanding curiosity. And working with Van as a postdoc was quite interesting because he, he was actually my contemporary, but he, he was way ahead of all of us in terms of his background in science. And when Van decided to return to Hopkins to join the cell biology department is because a, a wonderful young scientist, Tom Pollard, had come down from Harvard to rebuild the anatomy department as a, a, a cell biology anatomy research enterprise. And it was an exciting time. And so uh, it was clear from working with Van that red cells had a major opportunity for research scientists because you could get pure membranes. And it's not a simple task to isolate membranes from any other eukaryotic cell, but red cells, you can lyse them and wash away the 
hemoglobin and have a pure prep. And of course, the most serious disease of red cells is, is malaria. Sure. And so I, I was interested in malaria and planned to, to work on malaria, but we, we made some discoveries in, in the red cell that caused us to go in a new direction. And that was the discovery of the, the aquaporin, aquaporin one. And that, that came at a point in my career where I, I had to make some decisions. I had completed my residency and research fellowship, and I, I had a faculty position at Johns Hopkins in hematology with most of my time protected for research. Of course, I had to fund that to get grants to pay my salary. But in, in those historical times, it was not as difficult as it is today. But the discovery of the aquaporins was a sheer example of serendipity. And it was a chance for us to run in a new direction. And it, it led to a lot of interest worldwide and yeah. some prizes as well. <laughs> was there a specific experiment that you could describe in simple terms for the rest of us that led you to realize that you must be onto something because people had been looking for the water channel for a long time. Yeah, well, not a lot of people were looking for the water channel, but biophysicists and physiologists realized that membrane water permeability varied. And some cells, like our surface epithelium, there's limited water permeability. If we soak in a hot tub, it may get a little bit of fluid intake, but very minor. Or other cells, such as our red cells, have enormous water permeability. That's why they lyse so easily. They also, if you drop a red cell into a hypertonic buffer, it'll shrink. And it was actually on a family vacation where I had a conversation, and it was in Chapel Hill, of all places, with John C. Parker, my former hematology mentor, sure. who was himself a very gifted me membrane physiologist studying ion fluxes in red cell membranes. And I had taken the family to Disney World uh, and camping in the Everglades. And the long drive back to Baltimore, we stopped in Chapel Hill. And I had a conversation with John after listening to me describe this new protein of 28 kilodaltons mass, abundant red cells, but it didn't stain with Kumasi. No one seemed to know about it. And it was also present in renal tubules, and we did a gene search, and there were fragments of DNA from diverse sources, including brains of insects, uh, plants, bacteria that were genetically similar. And it was John Parker who put it all together. He, it was a conversation that I'll never for, forget. He had been the attending in the intensive care unit and he stayed, stayed up because I, I called ahead to arrange a meeting with him. So he'd been up all night, but we had this conversation and it was almost as if a light bulb went off in the, his head. And he said, you know, Peter, these, these tissues were, this new protein, this are highly permeable to water. Have you considered this might be the long sought water channel? Oh my gosh. Uh, not me. <laughs> I never heard of water and channel used to describe a unique entity. And so clearly, uh, it was John's insight. And then he, he, he made some very nice suggestions. He had a colleague from the graduate program at Duke, who was in the physiology department at Johns Hopkins, Bill Gagino, and he strongly encouraged me to contact Bill and see if we could explore if this new protein was a water channel. And Bill, he was my age, we were both young scientists at the time, this is like 1991, so 30 years ago. And we set about 
expressing this new protein and Xenopus laid us oocytes, frog eggs. And Bill was quite an authority on the Xenopus labus system because he was using it to study the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, the important membrane transporter, which is the cause of cystic fibrosis. And I had an exceptionally enthusiastic postdoctoral fellow, Gregory Preston, a graduate of the University of Connecticut, who came to my lab to, as a postdoc. And we, we put Greg on the water channel project, and he, he was masterful in terms of his ability to get experimental systems to work. And uh, in the first test, six test oocytes, the six control oocytes, it was obvious that the test oocytes all exploded rapidly when, and exposed to distilled water, whereas the control oocytes swelled very slowly. Mm. It was a dramatic moment, and that, that really changed things for our lab. Uh, that's a fascinating story from uh, your conversation with Dr. Parker to working with a colleague and leveraging studies in fundamental organisms to make a remarkable discovery. That's oh my beautiful. Gosh. It, it also is really clear that if I didn't have the intellectual support, John Parker, or Bill Gagino, or yes. Greg Press and the postdoc, it would have failed. Right. Their insight and their generosity and enthusiasm made it happen. Well, that was, I guess, in the late 80s, early 90s, and fast forward a little more than a decade. I want to bring you to October of 2003, and you received a call. And tell us, since so few people will ever get that call, tell us what it's like to get that call at presumably five in the morning or so. Well, I, I suspect that I, I was not alone in having daydreams about pleasant calls from Stockholm. It never seemed realistic, so I never spent much time obsessing over the fact that prizes are sometimes awarded for discoveries that you can be involved in. But uh, there were very positive responses when I would lecture about this new water channel protein, the aquaporin. And it was a, at Wright State University in Ohio, Peter K. Lauf, the director of physiology, invited me to give a seminar. And afterwards, he came up to me and said, you know, this, this is really important. I think you're going to win a Nobel Prize. And I <laughs> didn't, didn't want to even think about it. And then, and then it happened a few more times. So it, it seemed like I had been in the right place at the right time. And with the, the mentors that I described and just that sheer luck, it, it all fit together. But when the call came, it was not a total surprise because they're very careful. The Swedes don't gossip. They take in information, but it's never been leaked who, who is a, the front runner. They, they, they maintain perfect confidentiality, but they, there was a conference organized by the chemistry committee of, the, well, of the, the Nobel Chemistry Committee from the Royal Society of Sciences, and it's held outside of Stockholm in August of 2003, and the presentations came from all of the leading membrane transport laboratories. And Rod McKinnon was one of the presenters. And it seemed like there's a chance that somebody in the room was being scrutinized. Then I, in the autumn, I got a call from an investigator from Kyotobori, Sweden. And I, I didn't know the name. I didn't recognize it. And I, I sent an email to a Swedish colleague said, do you know? who Bank Nordin is, he's asked to visit our laboratory. And I, I got a thoughtful reply. No, you probably don't know Bank Nordin. He's a physical chemist, 
but you might be interested to know that he's the chair of the Nobel Chemistry Committee. It's like, what? <laughs> he wants to visit me? And Bank, in turn, shared a little information, and it was part of a visit. To, I think his daughter was working in Los Angeles, but he wanted to stop by and visit a few laboratories. And he, he actually had just come from New York. He met with somebody. It was probably Rod McKinnon. And then after meeting with me, he, he wanted to meet with Andy Fire at the Carnegie Institution. Of course, in retrospect, he was getting information, but it was never made clear that you will get this prize, but there was enough clue that I could sort of feel that I had to be ready. Of course, you never tell the press that because it sounded very immodest. <laughs> oh, I always knew that this would happen. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody can say that they always knew it would happen. Sure. Certainly not me. Yeah. How does winning the Nobel change your life? Well, it, it has some positive features and it has some negative features. Certainly the joy of celebrating science and being in contact with hundreds of people from my past, even to, to my grade school classmates, that, that all was very wonderful. But there's also a, a, a loss of privacy that comes with intense media attention and the expectations that you're going to say something brilliant. At least I felt that I, I didn't have any brilliant thoughts and I was glad to share my opinions, but I didn't really feel totally prepared for the intensity of the, the interest. In, in part, Hopkins had gone through a, a long dry spell in terms of Nobels. In 1978, Dan Nathans and Hamilton Smith shared the Nobel with scientists from Switzerland for the discovery of the restriction enzymes. So that was 25 years of no Nobel. Mm. And so there was a lot of celebration at Hopkins. And it wasn't just in our department. It was throughout the medical school, the security guards, the, the hospital staff. It was something that was good for the community. And I, I like that. Yeah, that's wonderful. What advice would you give young trainees who are embarking on their medical and research careers? Yeah, I think it's important to identify a mentor that you can look up to in a, in a genuine way, admire what they're doing, and also who has a group that would be helpful because you're going to spend more time talking to the lab members than the lab chief, but both are quite important. And so I, I feel like I've had some outstanding mentors. I, I talked about John and Van. But uh, I, I did a sabbatical to learn DNA technology and worked in the laboratory of Steve McKnight at the Carnegie Institution. He took me in for a year in his laboratory. And we, we did a nice paper on the losing zipper DNA binding motif, but it was really an opportunity to get the technology to do molecular biology in my own laboratory. So... Certainly winning the Nobel changes one's life, as you've indicated. And following that, you have moved you know, your professional life in a number of directions. One is as a strong ambassador for science. And you've been involved in fostering international scientific collaborations, sometimes in, in nations where the United States did not necessarily have a very favorable uh, interaction. And what inspired you to do this? Was there a, an event? Was it just personal motivation, an inspirational figure? Well, I, I think from the very beginning, it was clear that some scientists had credentials that the public looked up to. And Linus Pauling was a, a classic example. Uh, of course, if you ask a student today about Linus Pauling, uh, he's remembered for his work on vitamin C, which is 
regarded as, as a mistake, but he, he was fearless in terms of traveling and sharing his views on science and in particular the dangers of nuclear weapons testing. But I, I had no delusion that I would be Linus Pauling's counterpart. It was more an extension of a fascination in travel. When I was 17 years old, I was part of a group of university students that traveled to Soviet Union and camped at campgrounds. And so I, I, I was really excited about that. It was organized by my high school German teacher, Horst Momber, who went on to become a high school principal in Seattle. But the, the notion that faraway places are accessible and very interesting. That was in my mindset. And, and my, my dad also, in, in his summers, he would sometimes teach in India at Indian universities. And so that also underscored the, the value of international travel. When I was elected the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a new program in science diplomacy had just been started my predecessor, David Baltimore, led a group who visited Syria. And they, they met with everybody. They met up with the president of Syria, Asher Masai, who was himself an eye surgeon. And so as his successor, the group at AAAS, in collaboration with the, the CRDF International, a nonprofit Washington uh, had, had worked to get an invitation to visit North Korea. And so I, I, I joined their efforts and we went to North Korea. We've been back a couple of times since and have made scientific friendships with leading scientists in North Korea. Of course, it's impossible to contact them directly and discuss things, but Sooner or later, North Korea will have a change in government. And knowing that leading scientists could be very helpful. So it's, it's a multiple in interests. So in sort of wrapping up our conversation, I wanted to end with sort of an interesting fact about you, which is not quite on par with winning the Nobel, but it's a big deal to be on the Colbert Report. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, you were on the Colbert Report in 2006, and you spoke about the need for the public to appreciate the benefits of science. And do you think that perception has changed? And you know, obviously we've been through one of the most visible demonstrations of the impact of science with the pandemic. So has that perception changed? Should we as a community be doing more? I, I think I think we should be doing more. Now, there was a workshop that you organized at the National Academy of Sciences two years ago. And at that event, this topic came up. And, and I recall my, my concern was that we really didn't have a, a champion for science. I, I, I mentioned that Tony Fauci was perhaps our most visible scientist. Well, of course, Tony Fauci has become a, a, a rock star for science. I mean, there was some political opposition, but by and large, he provided straight information to the American public, and the public needed the information and wanted the information. So I, I think Tony Fauci deserves a special recognition for get guiding us through this horrible pandemic. But Tony is 80 years old, and he, he's still very youthful, but it's going to be time soon to have new representatives of science. I, I think uh, the physician scientists have a particularly important role because they have the expertise in two areas. And of course, now we, we've faced a pandemic, the worst in, in, in a century, but there'll be more problems 
infectious diseases, viruses. And I think the arguments now about being ready for these are overwhelmingly supportive of more science and involvement of scientists in the decision-making process. And there's no guarantee. I see Senator Rand Paul, who is himself a, a medical doctor, a Duke University graduate, has now had his Twitter feed blocked because of sharing misinformation. So one of our own in a high position is abusing the, the situation. Uh, I, I think the public would like to know. But they, they would need to hear from someone who's good at explaining it. And I, I'm not that person. I now developed a Parkinson's and it's not easy to speak clearly, but we have plenty of talent. And I, I think the public will be very grateful if the younger physician scientists follow the tradition of Tony Fauci and make themselves available and speak responsibly and clearly. And I'm, I'm optimistic that young scientists will emerge. Well, thank you. You, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, for the audience, the meeting that uh, Peter's referencing occurred on February 20th of 2020, just before, you know, the, the pandemic really shut us down, but it was a very important meeting on, on physician scientists and, and Dr. Agari, along with a number of leading authorities and leaders in science and medicine had convened. So I appreciate the comment, Peter, and that we need that next generation of individuals like yourself or Tony, who are ambassadors for science, for medicine, but also public health policy, which is so vitally important and needed, and to be able to communicate science and medicine clearly and in a simple manner to the public, um, so vitally important because there's so much misinformation these days. And so we really need those ambassadors to be out there. So uh, a, an important charge from you to the rest of us and the next generation of physician scientists. So thank you for that. Well, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. But we're, we're counting on you, Mukesh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know you will deliver. You are already delivering. All right. Well, Peter, I think that I think wraps up our conversation. And I just want to take a moment at a sort of a personal level, having gotten to know you a little bit over the last few years. Just thank you, um, first of all, for your time and your commitment to science, medicine, and the physician scientist. Um, but also for your kindness, your modesty, and your generosity as you describe your science. It's very refreshing, it's decidedly uncommon, and it's very inspiring. And for that, I just wish to thank you, um, certainly for myself, but for so many that I think feel the same way. So thank you for your time and all that you do. Well, you're, you're most welcome, and I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity, and I'm very much looking forward to the visit. As are we, sir, as are we. So with that, um, thank you, Peter. Um, we've taken a lot of your time, and we'll be following up with you, of course, uh, as the event draws closer. Excellent. 